please join me for our opening prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, you have promised to meet us when we earnestly seek you. Come and reveal your presence to us this morning, Lord, as we open our hearts to you. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us so that we may experience your love anew today and so that we may be transformed by it. May we truly be your people, redeemed by your love. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Good morning, friends. It is May. Is anyone else just like surprised that it is May? And May came on in like a lion. That's not supposed to happen. Everything looks so fresh and power washed this morning. <laughs> Didn't it? Didn't it? Pristine. It is so good to see you here. It's an honor to welcome you to worship this morning. It is great to see smiling faces here, and also we welcome those who are worshiping with us online. Um, what a great honor and a joy it is that we may worship together, regardless of the physical place where we are, and the Lord joins us right there, sends his spirit to us. Uh, welcome to all. A warm welcome. Um, the announcements were on the wall earlier. I know you probably saw those. And also, they're always on our Facebook page. It is a great place to, to go to when you're looking for information about what's happening in the life of our church. So we ask you to check that often uh, and call the church office, too, if there are ever any questions. And there is one announcement to highlight this morning. Um, our First Fruit Children's Ministry has Vacation Bible School coming up. Uh, it will be every Wednesday evening in the month of June. And we are asking that you be on the lookout for the donation display that will be coming out soon. Uh, and Pam will have an announcement coming up uh, in the weeks to come as to how we can support this vital ministry for our church and for our children. Um, so we ask you to be watching for that. And now will you please join me for our call to worship. It comes to us from Psalm 30. We will read responsively. I will exalt you, Lord, for you rescued me. You refuse to let my enemies triumph over me. O oh Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you restored my help. You brought me up from the grave, O oh Lord. You kept me from falling into the pit of death. Sing to the Lord, all the godly ones. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only for a moment, but his favor lasts for a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. You have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You have taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy. That I may sing praises to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. Amen. Good morning, my friends. It's nice to see each of you here. And uh, we've just expressed ourselves in a very special way through that call to worship. Trust you're ready to sing. We have an opportunity to sing God's praises, which reminds me that tonight we're going to have a Sunday night service here at 6 o'clock. And we're going to do a lot of good singing and some preaching and some praying. Oh, how we need to pray. There are so many needs across our world, and God's people needs to come together as often as we can to worship him. And we have that opportunity this morning to stand and sing our opening hymn, number 327, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Would you join me? Rose. 
was victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lived that death may die. Crown him the Lord of peace, whose power a scepter sways from frail to pride that wars may cease, and all be prayer and praise. His reign shall know no end, and round his beauty feet, fair flowers of paradise exempt their fragrance. The Lord of love, you hold his hands and sigh. These wounds turn visible above in beauty glorified. Oh, hail, Redeemer, hail, thou hast died for me. Thy praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. Wonderful. Our next hymn is number 172. My Jesus, I love thee. My Jesus, I love thee. Do you realize that Jesus loves you so very much? It calls for us to return that love. Let's sing about it. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on
glad they put that fourth stanza up there. <laughs> that wasn't in the book, but it's in our heart. Amen? Yes. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we thank you for the way that you love us, for the way that you work in our hearts, for the mercy that you pour out on us and the grace you share with us. Lord, we ask in this moment, as, as we reflect back on the week, that you would open our eyes to all the ways that you've been working in our life. We confess, Lord, there are times when we have uh, known your touch, we've heard your word, but instead of following you, we've chosen to go our own way. And so, Lord, we ask that you would forgive us because we are still sinners in need of your grace. Lord, we thank you that long before we did anything, you sent Jesus into this world to live and to teach and to guide us and to ultimately lay down his life on the cross to not only show us the way, but to be the way back into your arms and your family and your kingdom. And Lord, we thank you uh, that your love didn't stay there on the cross. It didn't stay in the tomb. But three days later, by the power of your Holy Spirit, Jesus raised from the dead and is seated at your right hand, and he's interceding right now on behalf of all the prayers that we don't know how to pray ourselves. And so with the, the great encouragement that we have, we come and we bring our burdens on our hearts for our friends and our family and our loved ones, those whose lives touch our own, for our world. We pray for healing. We pray for peace. We pray for comfort. Lord, we pray that uh, you would move and lead and guide our, our leaders, our people. Lord, for uh, those of us who are, are serving, we pray that you would empower us to serve by the power of your Spirit. We pray that our lives would bear fruit for you. And we lift this all uh, with the courage that we know that you know more about these situations than we do. Lord, you're more able to act, and you love these people even more than we do. So we pray that you put your love in our hearts as we come as your children and pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now I want to invite the ushers come to come forward at this time. And Lord, we pray as we uh, gather up our offering this morning that you would take these gifts just a small part of what you've given to us that we return to you and that you would break them and bless them and use them to feed the multitude in your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
great blessing. Friends, I ask you to stand if you are able and please join me as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. Please stand. Brothers and sisters, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we prepare our hearts for today's scripture reading, which comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, and starting with verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? And they answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? <laughs> Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Thank you, Melanie. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the powerful way that it speaks into our lives and shapes and changes us. Lord, we thank you um, for your spirit that so inspired this word and faithfully carried it to us today and is here among us even now. We pray by the power of your spirit you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts that we might receive you well. In Jesus' name, amen. Somewhere in my younger years, I watched the movie Mary Poppins. You all know the movie Mary Poppins? And I remember I picked up uh, from one of the songs that she sang that the work you do goes better and faster if you can make a game out of it. I took that to heart, and I'd often try to make games out of chores at home, and it made cleaning my room and taking out the trash a lot more enjoyable. It also made doing the dishes a lot messier, which required showers after doing that kind of task. But there was a point where the idea of making work into a game really started to break down. One evening, my mom left my brother and myself uh, home to mop the kitchen floor while she was going out to get groceries. She was really nice. She got out the mop and bucket for us. She put soap in it and helped fill it with hot water. All we had to do was clear and sweep the floor and mop, and it should have been a simple 10-minute job at the most. Unfortunately for my mom, I had an active imagination, and I very quickly found a much more fun way to mop the floor. Rather than using the mop to pick up the dirt, I decided we could do it all at once by dumping the bucket of soapy water on the floor directly and skating around in our socks, which were basically mops for our feet anyway. Now, there was a distinct change in attitude when mom returned as she changed from pride in her boys for taking responsibility, growing up and helping out with these chores, to the panic of how to clean up the bigger mess. And my brother and I went from the joy of inventing this new game called Mopping the Floors to the terror at the look on mom's face. Having a half an inch of standing water on the floor will do that for you. That was the day that I discovered there is a solid line between getting work done and just playing. This is a problem for us who follow Jesus, not just for kids with big imaginations. Paul wrote in his letter, John wrote uh, in the, the Revelation, the last book of the Bible, and Jesus himself told parables recorded in the Gospels that the Son of Man is coming back. And he will want to know if we've accomplished the work that he gave to us or if we've just been playing and making a mess. Thankfully, we can learn and grow from our mistakes, choosing not to repeat them over and over again because God guides us and his patient love surprises and transforms us. So after the initial crazy moments of seeing Jesus alive again, after his crucifixion and death, Things changed in the upper room where the disciples had huddled together. Jesus had given them a mission to go share the grace of God, which is the forgiveness of sin and the power to live as a disciple of Jesus with the whole world. And in their ears, as they feared for their lives still, I'm sure this didn't sound like a naturally fun job. They knew once they started down that road, they would end up on a cross too. So what did these most dedicated disciples do? They decided to go fishing instead. Peter went back to the boats because that was what he knew. Yes, the world needed preaching and teaching, but he needed a real job, and his family needed him to bring home food. Jesus was not doing the miracle potlucks anymore. Perhaps he could make disciples from other fishermen out there on the lake. He could make the best of both worlds. But it was not what Jesus had asked them to do. And Jesus came to call Peter out of the fishing boat, out of the water, the same way he did the first time that they met. Now, many preachers and teachers have debated over the years whether it was sinful and disobedient for Peter to go back fishing. And I'm here to tell you, I don't know. Jesus didn't say. Others might point to their failure at fishing that day as a sign that you can't experience success outside of your calling, but I don't believe that at all, because if that were the case, then anyone rich and famous would be for sure bound for heaven, 
and those who were poor, sick, and struggling would be lost. But Jesus usually taught that the opposite is true. Success looks different from the eyes of Jesus. One thing we can know for sure, though, is that the risen Jesus gave Peter a job, and Peter decided to go fishing for fish instead of fishing for people. And Jesus called him out on that. Mom called my brother and I out of the water, just as the Spirit of God calls us out of the waters of our baptism. We may not get the, the you are my beloved child with you and I am well pleased kind of experience the way Jesus did at his baptism. But God clearly shows us that there is a letting go of the past and a taking up a new life in following Jesus for us. The water is just a symbol of the spiritual baptism that we are to walk in daily with the Holy Spirit fire, burning away the chaff that covers us and keeps us from glorifying God in everything that we do. Now, there was some education that happened there as well. This is not the way to do things. Just because it seemed more fun, more convenient, more time-saving, or whatever other reason we had, uh, did not make it right. And the rightness of how to do it, the job that Jesus gives us, is not based on our personal preference. It's based on the end result. I didn't understand that, at the time when I was trying to mop the floor there, that the more fun way actually left the floor dirtier and damaged the floor around and underneath the linoleum. I just thought it was more fun. Your mission is not just a catchy statement. Our mission as a church is not just a catchy statement. It's what we are doing. The disciples did not have a mission statement like businesses do today. They had give, uh, been given instructions just the way our parents give us when we have to do our chores. And you all know, those of you who've raised children or worked with children, that different children need to be taught in different ways. And Jesus, knowing Peter and knowing that Peter was a leader of the disciples, wanted to make sure that Peter would pass on that teaching accurately. Now, I say accurately but when I say accurately, I don't mean literally, because Jesus often taught things more accurately by describing them in a roundabout way. So Jesus asked Peter three times if Peter loved him, and three times Peter said yes. It's not a repetitive conversation, because the word for love in the Greek language that doesn't always get translated into English changes in that conversation. So I want to give you a really quick paraphrase Tony's quick translation of how this may have sounded in their original conversation. Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than the others? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I like you a lot. And Jesus says, feed my lambs. And then again, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I like you a lot. And Jesus says, tend my sheep. Now, I wonder what our church would look like today if Jesus had given the mission to go fish for sinners, similar to he did when he first called them out of the water. Maybe we would focus our efforts on pulling people out of their comfort zones, like fish out of the water, into our boat, where we could get what we could out of them, and pray that God would send us more fishermen and fisherwomen, and that call to fish for people... Uh, uh, we're, we're, and pray that God would send us more fishermen and women. That call to fish for people then got Peter out of the boat the first time. But as he grew in his faith, his mission changed. And I want, that, I want you to notice that in our text today. His mission changed from fishing to shepherding. Why did Jesus give Peter this new mission with shepherd metaphors? Because our mission is not about getting more of ourselves into the church. It's about getting more of Jesus into ourselves. Now, there are going to be things that Jesus calls us to do that are outside of our experience and outside of our expertise. We're going to have to be willing to learn and to grow into this new life, not just do the things we already know how to do. We have lots of talent, resources, and ideas when we collaborate together as a team, as a community, and as a family. But even on our best days, we fall short of the work that Jesus has for us. 
We can accomplish our earthly tasks with natural gifts, but it takes, pass, uh, uh, takes gifts given by God's Spirit, trained up by disciple-makers of Jesus, for us to accomplish the life-changing work of Jesus. That is our purpose as his church. So Jesus put this rather plainly for Peter. The third time he says, Simon, son of John, do you like me a lot? And Peter says, Lord, you know everything. You know I like you a lot. When you're young, Jesus says, your life was your own. But as you grow old, you will be led to places that you do not want to go. Peter couldn't tell Jesus he loved him. I want you to hear that. Peter couldn't tell Jesus that he loved him. Jesus was asking for the self-sacrificing love that he showed Peter on the cross. But the best Peter was willing to promise was the love shared in a family. He didn't want to be like Jesus. He still wanted to be Simon, son of John. Jesus had other plans for him, though. He was making him into Peter, the rock on whom the rest of the church would rest, not a fisherman, not the Messiah, the first under-shepherd who would be known by his love. Peter would raise up new lambs, and he would tend sheep. He would not pull others out of their comfort zones into his boat. He would leave his comfort zone and join them in new pasture lands, raising up new families of faith right where they lived in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and on to Rome. And through Peter, people would come to know Jesus all over the world. Peter would grow to one day be able to say, yes, Jesus, I love you with all that I am and all that I have. And Peter would lay his life down as proof of that love. If Jesus asked you if you loved him, could you honestly say yes? If Jesus asked you to show your love for him, would you do what he asked? Are you willing to love others the way that Jesus loves you? And are you willing to follow Jesus wherever he leads you? Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your love that chases us wherever we are and doesn't leave us there, but draws us to new life in you. We pray, Lord, by the power of your Spirit, you would work and move in our hearts to grow beyond ourselves and to grow into your likeness. We lift us up in Jesus' name. Amen.
would you join me as we renew our relationship of love with our God and our Savior. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. The body of Christ, broken for you, and the blood of Christ shed for you. As we stand to sing our closing hymn, the altar is open for anyone who would like to come forward and pray. Richard, will you come lead us? It's wonderful to tell you that whatever you face, our Heavenly Father says he will be with us. That's what Jesus said. You will never be alone. So remember your mission. For me, it's something different from yours. But we all have a mission. And remember, your love for Jesus. Where he leads me, I will follow. Number 338, we're going to sing the first.
second and fourth stanzas of where he leads me, I will follow. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take my cross. name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, following Jesus wherever he leads you, and know that he loves you every step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>